Jim. This is the launch operations manager. The launch team wishes you good luck and Godspeed. Uh, thank you very much. No, it'll be a good one. We sometimes say moonshot to be a miracle, but the moonshot wasn't a miracle. The, the moonshot was just great engineering uh, of NASA from 1961 to 1969. I'm old enough to remember it uh, and to have watched every part of uh, Mercury, uh, Gemini, and Apollo missions. Uh, and that was just the greatest demonstration of organized engineering prowess you could ever imagine. But it wasn't a miracle, it was just good, rigorous engineering. The shame of our world is that knowing that the climate issue is an existential issue, we haven't gotten organized to do a moonshot. You know, I think if you really want to do something about climate change, you need to stop talking about it as this sort of apocalyptic threat because it actually makes it much harder for anyone to embrace sort of pragmatic, reasonable actions to deal with it. Part of the problem we haven't seen more action on climate change is it's traditionally thought of not as a technological problem, but as a moral problem where people need to change their behavior, they need to change how they think about the environment, and we have all we have all the technologies we need, which is something we hear all the time. You know, we have wind and solar, so we're ready to go. But that is not the case. The truth of it is that it is a drop in the bucket in terms of doing anything meaningful on climate. what powering America can be with your help. We love wind! This is Generation Wind at Wind Power 2016. We have a moral imperative to make the shift from a fossil fuel-based dinosaur economy to a 100% renewable economy, and we can do it. You could power the United States, you could power most of the world, renewably if you just decided to do it. Already in much of the country, solar and wind will beat uh, your utility bill. The statement that caught my attention from you was, there is enough uh, wind to be harnessed, enough solar power to be generated to, to power the entire world. The good news is that renewable energy is not only achievable, but good economic policy. Now must be our moment for action. We've done 50 states for 50 plans. You can go on our website. Every state has a plan to take God it to 100% renewable energy. Mark Ruffalo. The public and even a lot of policymakers are just convinced that we're moments away from the tipping point where solar and wind are going to run the world. But it's just, it's a fantasy. One of the issues is that variability of wind and solar. The sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, and it's not just on a daily basis, but the wind and the sun are often not really available over weeks. And if batteries are only useful for daily fluctuations. The second problem is that siting energy facilities of any kind is extremely challenging. We're talking about millions upon millions of wind turbines. Um, it's large concentrated solar plants in deserts. Those things are not uncontroversial. Try and go site a wind farm in northern Maine. There's going to be significant political and social issues with that level of renewables build out. The fact of the matter is nobody likes uh, any of the energy alternatives. 
if it's wind, it's unsightly and it kills migratory birds. And if it's solar, it covers huge areas uh, in uh, dryland ecosystems, which can be threatening. And in any event, you have high voltage direct current lines uh, that have to cross from the renewable source to the population areas. And for every additional megawatt of, of wind or solar you add, that's going to require backup generation, it's going to require additional transmission, or you just have to way overbuild the system. We're talking about trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. We've been at renewables for 20 years, and we're at 5%, and that's great. But we really need to be at 100% zero carbon by the middle of the century. It makes sense to, to scale up renewables up to some point, like 20% or so. After that, you need something called baseload, you know, sort of a source of power that goes day and night 24-7. And what could possibly supply that? Well, it's going to be fossil fuels or it's going to be nuclear. In the last five to ten years, a new crop of entrepreneurs have really come onto the scene and they've been developing advanced nuclear technologies to answer the questions that we have about climate change and um, to really try to provide a lot of low carbon energy. You have a set of these small startups run by, you know, these really young, idealistic people who are just finished their graduate studies and who have kind of come up with these really innovative designs. You know, call it sort of nuclear 2.0. And the kids that have been coming into nuclear engineering over the last decade have been exceptionally talented. They're not coming into this field because they think they can get rich. They're coming into it because they think that this is an area where they can actually do something that's important for humanity. Ever since the early days, the nuclear industry has had both a lot of momentum, but also a lot of inertia. It's an industry that requires gigantic corporations and lots of coordination between very slow moving bodies and it takes a very long time to turn a very large ship. And as a startup, instead of having all of this inertia, we're trying to do something that allows us to be much more nimble. I want to build an advanced reactor in the next decade so that we can build them all across the planet. It's even bigger than the 1984 one that I have. I think people of our generation are the first ones that have the opportunity to look at nuclear power without all of the emotional baggage that, that previous generations have felt. The very first geopolitical event that I can remember was the fall of the Berlin Wall when I was four years old. So for me, there was never that looming Cold War nuclear threat. The strongest association I had in my childhood with nuclear power was probably Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. <laughs> Mark and I started Transatomic when we were midway through our PhDs in nuclear engineering at MIT because we wanted to develop a nuclear reactor that addressed safety issues and waste issues. It started out as an academic pursuit, but once we started working on this, it seemed like we might actually be onto something. Conventional nuclear reactors are cooled by water that's heated up far past its normal boiling point, so it has to be held at high pressure to keep it liquid. If there's a break in the system, the water can flash into steam and cause a loss of coolant accident, which could lead to a reactor meltdown. There's a simpler approach that gives you safety just through physics, and there's no way to break physics. Our design is actually adapted from an earlier type of nuclear reactor called a molten salt reactor. So our type of salt has the radioactive material, the uranium, dissolved in the salt itself. One of the great things about molten salt reactors is that they operate at the same pressure as the surrounding atmosphere. And if there's an accident, the liquid fuel drains into a holding tank below the reactor, where it can cool itself down and freeze solid over the course of a few hours. So in a molten salt reactor, the fuel starts out liquid and ends up solid, which means you've avoided a meltdown. A lot of times we'll say that advanced reactors are meltdown proof or uh, they can't have catastrophic accidents or they're walk away safe. And what that really means is that if something goes wrong at the plant, if there's a tsunami or an earthquake or an airplane hits it, the plant shuts down on its own 
and is able to cool without the need for human intervention. So we were able to take the earlier molten salt reactor design and we were able to make it 20 times as power dense, much more compact, orders of magnitude cheaper. And so we are commercializing our design for a new type of nuclear reactor that can consume existing stockpiles of nuclear waste. When we say it's waste or spent fuel, it still has 95% uranium in it. The reason it's spent is because it's no longer able to get the necessary uh, energy that they want out of the reactor core. It's like taking a log and putting it in the fireplace and burning the bark off of it and then throwing away the log. And unfortunately, that log that you're throwing away is also very radioactive. Waste is a concern for a lot of people. For a lot of people, it's their first concern about nuclear power. But what's really amazing about it is that most of what we call nuclear waste could actually be used again for fuel. And if you use it again for fuel, you don't have to store it for tens of thousands of years. With these advanced reactors, you can close the fuel cycle. You can start using that spent fuel, recycling it, turning it into new fuel over and over again. Able to respond to your shop. Awesome. We started thinking about how we could start our own company that could be small and nimble and bring this to fruition as quickly as possible. The ending goal of Transatomic is to build a nuclear reactor. And as we know, nuclear reactors cost on the order of a couple billion dollars. There's no one out there that's instantly going to say, oh, I love that idea, here's five billion dollars, go build it. It's gonna happen in stages. To put this simply, a nuclear reactor is not an app. This is not the kind of idea that can be fueled on pizza and lines of code, and poof, you make $100,000. The risk is proportional to the reward, and this is about as big as it gets. So in uh, spring of 2011, we incorporated the company, actually 25 years to the day after the Chernobyl meltdown, though we didn't realize it at the time. There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union, and the Soviets have admitted that it happened. The accident occurred at the Chernobyl nuclear plant in the Ukraine. There may be a major disaster. This morning, there are real fears of a meltdown in Japan. There has been a giant explosion at a nuclear power plant there, I mean, we had a meeting that day. We were watching some of the explosions on the screen, and we were all just terrified. And I just remember looking at it kind of in shock. I was worried, you know, for the people out there. It was like the nightmare scenario. Like, these non-Soviet bloc reactors were sort of blowing up on the screen, and here we are trying to tell everyone that nuclear is safe. The perception of the risks and the history of a couple of meltdowns have really scared the public off of nuclear plants. For a bunch of reasons, they've been unacceptable to publics around the world. During that time, you get these nuclear plants, everyone's freaked out. I mean, they became these sort of projection screens for sort of everybody's fears about nuclear energy and energy production more generally. They obviously have a problem. They might have come close to exposing the core. If that's true, then we came very close to the China syndrome. If the core is exposed, for whatever reason, the fuel heats beyond core heat tolerance in a matter of minutes, nothing can stop it, render an area the size of Pennsylvania permanently uninhabitable. Frank, it was an accident at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant, which is located on an island in the Susquehanna River, 10 miles... Well, I grew up and experienced the uh, Three Mile Island scare because I was living downwind from uh, Three Mile Island at that time. And it's natural to say, look, I'm afraid of this. If that's a normal response. But if you think about it, the fact of it is, in the United States, there's tens of thousands of people being killed every year in automobile accidents. And yet, what we hear in the news is about airplane crashes. But air travel is one of the safest forms of travel that we know of. I mean, I think the situation with nuclear power is a little bit like this, that when there's a Fukushima or Chernobyl, it gets in the news because it's so unusual. It's all very well to worry about nuclear safety, as we all should. 
But we also have to weigh that against the safety of other forms of power production. So if people think of Chernobyl, they think of Fukushima and so forth. What they don't think of is the one to two million lives that nuclear power has saved by virtue of displacing coal, which is lethal. Coal is by far the most dangerous form of energy we've ever engaged in. Uh, everybody knows this. And the American Medical Association estimates that 13,000 Americans die prematurely every year because of health-related problems of coal. More people die every day from particulates from the combustion of coal than have died in the entire history of nuclear power. So scientists look at it that way. I mean, you can't compare nuclear to no energy. That's not rational. You have to compare it to other forms of energy. Why should we treat nuclear any different? It's this irrational fear of the unknown. I was a nerdy kid. I loved reading and I liked, I realized early on I liked math and stuff because I felt like it was so logical. When I was younger, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And once I got to college, I got roped into doing work on a race car team. So I fell in love with it and working on that team, you kind of learn what mechanical engineering is before you actually take the classes. And then I realized I was really interested in nuclear. Um, I was exposed to a couple people who uh, did it. And 2008, I met Jacob DeWitt. I first got really interested in nuclear when I was like four or five. I was born and raised in Albuquerque, and my dad worked at Cindy National Laboratories. They say that about a quarter of Albuquerque's energy came from a nuclear power plant in Arizona, Palo Verde. And I was like, that's so cool. So that means when I go home and turn the lights on, it's nuclear power. I literally went home that day and turned the lights on and off and on and off, thinking that like every fourth time I did that, there was a nuclear powered, you know, light bulb. <laughs> so I'd always known I wanted to do something in nuclear power. I'd always known I wanted to study it. I met Caroline when I first visited grad school, and we ended up working in this course together in the summer of 2009. And it was around that time there was a resurgence of looking at nuclear and seeing what it can do. And we ended up start looking at what would it look like if we did this entrepreneurially. And the idea was to build this reactor, could actually consume and convert nuclear waste to energy. Uh, it was simpler, it was cheaper, it was, had all the great benefits you see with advanced technologies. But the thing that really stood out to me during that time was the question about how do you get one of these advanced reactors to market? Because it's really hard to get a customer for something brand new in the power space. The United States has a surprising number of microgrids or, or very expensive grids. People who live in remote areas and they can't get reliable electricity. That could be data centers, it could be remote extraction sites. That eventually evolved into us realizing that there's this huge, awesome opportunity in off-grid markets where they need power and they're relying on diesel generators because the only way you can get energy to these places, you can't run power lines, so the only way you can is by trucking up diesel fuel. And we were talking with some of these communities and we realized they use diesel fuel because it's the most energy-dense fuel that they know of. And I was like, man, nuclear is two million times as energy dense. And they were just, they kind of said that casually and they were like, wait, are you serious? Can you build a reactor that would be at that size? And I said, sure. So that got us thinking, man, we should go small to start. And that's kind of where the idea of starting a company formed into what it looks like today. Our first reactor is designed, it's basically a solid block of fuel that then has a tiny bit of fluid that carries heat out from the fuel up to where we would use it. And you don't have any pumps, you don't have any valves, you don't have any moving parts in that reactor block. And the heat is moved completely naturally, completely passively. So there's no intervention that can change it. The neat thing about this is that it can be manufactured at scale. And I think that's what all small modular reactors are hoping for, is something that you're not just building some humongous um, one-off thing that is only like that in one place. You can benefit from the economies of scale by mass producing something. The advanced nuclear plants that are being developed right now are very different from your grandfather's nuclear plant. We're talking about plants that are probably a third of the size, um, about a third of the material. You can roll them off the assembly line like Boeing's um, at a cost about a half or a third of today's nuclear plants. Today, a ship 
or a reactor can look a lot like IKEA furniture. It's factory fabricated. You just assemble it once you deliver it to the site. If we could start mass producing um, nuclear reactors, that'll just scale it up much faster. And that's how you get a big transition to clean energy globally. topic near to my heart. I've kind of been in, in the industry for a while. This is kind of my personal outreach. And it's just to answer, you know, we were talking to a lot of people about nuclear. We were pretty excited about it. And people always said kind of the same thing. They'd say, you know, my first thought is I, I'm not in favor of it, but honestly, I don't really know anything about it. That's a pretty common sentiment. That I really enjoy talking to people about nuclear. So we made this web page. Having gone into nuclear to help with the world's energy problems, I think, winning the public over or convincing them that it can be a good idea is, is absolutely essential. I have this web page, whatisnuclear.com, and I've enjoyed making that. That's meant to sort of communicate with intelligent people on the street. I feel like once people sort of understand what's going on with nuclear, they're much more open to it. It's when it's mysterious that they don't really, people don't like it. A fission chain reaction starts when a neutron encounters a uranium atom or some other nuclear fuel atom. When it, the neutron hits it, it just splits in half, and that splitting releases just an astounding amount of energy. It also releases a couple extra neutrons, so if one of those neutrons encounters another fuel atom, that atom will split, and then they'll continue on in this big chain reaction. So a nuclear reactor is just a machine that facilitates a nuclear chain reaction. Very few people understand what a nuclear reaction is. And of course, there is a huge confusion between the kind of nuclear reactions that result in an explosion, an atomic bomb, and the sort of nuclear reactions controlled that drive a plant. Most people don't understand that it's impossible for a nuclear power plant to literally to explode in the sense of an atomic explosion. But one thing I will say is that the nuclear industry are very bad marketers. We probably should have dropped the word nuclear when we went from making bombs to making power plants. That would have been smart. They're fission plants. Nuclear was introduced to the world through a weapon. But nowadays, the thing people are hearing about is environment or climate change. And from that perspective, nuclear is much more interesting. And I think to get people's support behind nuclear is really key to its, to its success and its ability to help us with the climate problem. Nearly 170 nations arrived here for the largest ever gathering of its kind. They'll take part in two weeks of intense negotiations aimed at forging a deal to limit global warming. 1995 was the first conference of the parties, the first COP, that was in Berlin. And I would say that the first 20 COPs have not delivered the goods. They have been a cop out, if I could put it that way, that they have not delivered the goods. COP21 is our last chance in the world to stay at the, even a remotely safe margin because we've had so much advance of human-induced climate change. It takes so long to pick up the pieces after a failure that if COP21 fails, uh, we're absolutely adrift in danger. I just arrived here in Paris. I'm here to give out 5,000 copies of my and my co-author's book, The Climate Campbell. I'm staying here at a place to be. There's like 500 activists staying there. Many of them seem to be anti this, anti that. I'm pretty sure that many of them are also anti-nuclear, which our book is not. It's pro-nuclear, pro-renewables, pro-efficiency, pro-evidence-based solutions for climate change. At least traditional environmental movements are, at the very least, playing this huge gamble right now. And that doesn't happen because they're bad people or stupid people, because they are not. They are very good, decent, smart people. But uh, the organizational DNA, so to speak, that they have inherited uh, is strongly anti-nuclear. The modern environmental movement is 
much of an outgrowth of, uh, of this early anti-nuclear movement. Nuclear is a hard sell. And ironically, some of the biggest foes are environmental organizations who have been using nuclear power as a whipping boy for decades to raise funds, and so it's very difficult for them. They've kind of painted themselves into an anti-nuclear corner because they've convinced so many people that it's a scary thing and that, and that we don't need it. And Jerry. Oh, hey, uh, can I interest you in a free book? Excuse me. Uh, can I interest you in a free book? So are you guys, are you guys uh, nuclear advocates? We are advocating for all the solutions. That we now need all the tools that we can have. And we... Can I uh, give you a free book? Are you putting out a pro-nuclear message? At uh, Place to Be, I wasn't really able to meet a lot of people who agreed with me that nuclear needed to be a big part of the solution until I met Rowley and Jan. I realized pretty early on that a lot of public opinion is vehemently against nuclear. I think what I've learned is that if you don't give people a chance to learn about this technology and change their mind, they never will. More sensors, reactors, more tremendous possibilities for humanity. And if we build them, history will show it was the right way to go. For If we care about the future of our children and grandchildren, we had better not leave it all to politicians. Scientists have an obligation to say everything they know, not limited to what the politicians want us to say. My three colleagues and I decided to try to help uh, the public understand the merits of nuclear power and the need for nuclear power if we're going to solve uh, the climate problem. Hi everybody, thank you so much for your patience and welcome to our press conference. So it's my great honor this afternoon to introduce four of the world's most famous and highly regarded climate scientists. Why are four climate scientists who don't have strong backgrounds in nuclear physics here talking to you today about nuclear energy. It's because we're scientists and we can do the math. If we truly are sincere about solving this problem, unless a miracle occurs, we are going to have to ramp up nuclear energy very fast. That's the reality. The numbers don't add up unless you put nuclear power in the mix. We have a question over here. Good afternoon. I simply want to say that your defiance towards renewables and your confidence towards nuclear power is uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the, the opposite of their current dynamics to deliver um, uh, so, so carbon-free electricity. Let me just throw in one thing to say that it's not only nuclear that needs to scale up extremely rapidly, but it's also solar and wind that uh, to solve the climate problem, we need to scale up every technology that makes sense as fast as we can. But the goal is not to make a renewable energy system. The goal is to make the most environmentally advantageous energy system we can while providing us with affordable power. And uh, there's really only one technology that I know of that can provide carbon-free power when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing at the scale that modern civilization requires, and that's nuclear power. You know, I like to emphasize that China and India are using tremendous amounts of power, almost all coal, for their electric plants. And there's no way that they can power their steel mills and all the other factories that they're building products for us on solar panels. You know, it's, and they know that. And for the West not to help them is immoral because we burned their share of the carbon budget. You know, I, I would argue that what we're going to find is that China is going to develop nuclear and uh, it's going to, it, it, it will find a market for it and we're, 
we're wasting uh, an opportunity if we don't develop our technology. Thank you. Remember when we were in the trade lessons? Yeah. So the regulator is, is neutral. And we just realized that we need to make a design that can go through this regulatory process. Everything is geared around getting enough testing or simulation data to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the reactor would operate safely, not present a risk to the public. I want to thank you for holding this hearing and for giving me the opportunity to testify. We started this company because we believe advanced reactors will be a significant part of the energy mix of the future, and we wanted to make that future reality as quickly as we could. We laud the recent work done by the Department of Energy and by this committee. These are crucial steps to help us seize the tremendous opportunities in front of us to advance nuclear power and also the massive opportunities that we have to be the leader at the global stage. Thank you. Starting a company in nuclear is hard, but if you start small and make some of that stuff more manageable, and then we can get bigger from there after we get our feet under us, so that when we start doing it on grid, we can be cheaper than coal, we can be cheaper than fossil, we can be the cheapest source of energy that can, and ultimately, that's the only way you displace fossil fuels. We are working on our first reactor, but it's not our only reactor. So this is our first product. We see it as kind of like the tip on the spear to get through the nuclear regulatory process in kind of the simplest way we see possible. So I guess I'd say that, you know, this is just the beginning. Uh, Jim is will be happy to have questions and we'd like to start with students first. Hello, um, my name is Sarah. I'm a high school senior at Highland Park High School. Hello, my name is Sophia. I'm a high school freshman in the neighboring town of Highland Park. My name is Hannah Morin. I'm a senior at Hopewell Valley Central High School. My name is Natalie and I'm a sixth grader. So my question is, what can we do to raise awareness in young people because they're the ones who are going to be taking the responsibility in the future? What can we do to raise awareness in young people about the dangers of human activity and the effects they have upon biodiversity on Earth? Yeah, well, that's a good question about what can young people do. I don't at all want to discourage individual actions. I just want to warn you that you've got to also hit the politicians and make them do what is needed on a national and global basis. It's not enough for young people to say, we want you to solve the problem. The young people also have to understand something about what is needed. Politicians will sometimes, well, you know, you've got to help them. I don't know, it's hard. You know, there are some advantages of getting old. You've had enough experiences that you can have a perspective, which you didn't have when you were a younger person. I worked for decades for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I spent 10 years uh, studying planet Venus and proposing an experiment to go to Venus. And then began to realize that this planet that we're living on is in some ways more interesting than Venus because this planet is changing before our eyes. And I was reluctant to be involved in the public discussion in terms of trying to describe what are the implications of the science. But eventually I decided to try to make the story clear. Barring a remarkable and improbable cooling, 1988 will be the warmest year on the record. This evidence represents a very strong case, in my opinion, that the greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate now. Well, there was a lot of reaction and publicity associated with that, and, and I tried to back out of that because I preferred to do the science. So I tried for decades to stay out of the, the politics. It was only in 2004 that I decided to get back in the communication 
And when I was asked, well, why are you doing this now, 15 years later, I said, well, I didn't want my grandchildren to say that Opa understood what was happening, but he didn't make it clear. <laughs> you know, I try to do what I can do, but it's, it's not easy. Because the fact is, it was just a matter of which generation is going to feel the brunt of the changes that are, will be coming unless we begin to rapidly reduce uh, fossil fuel emissions. The back area so it's just neat to see the walls up because uh, last time when we were here, you know, we just talked to the open space. So now we can start to see how it's all coming together. How many employees? Um, right now we'll have a, probably we'll have five out here not long after we move in, so okay. within like the first couple weeks. And then we'll hopefully grow that out to about 10 in the near, probably the next Ultimately, the, the way that all regulatory bodies look at this is they say, okay, it's a new reactor concept. So you can show us all the great computer simulations you want, but right now we still need some kind of hard physical data to support what your computer simulations say is happening. And so our view is, okay, let's do that. When we were looking at it, we came to appreciate all the great work that was done with the fast test reactors we had in this country and what was demonstrated at the national laboratories. Idaho National Laboratory is one of 17 Department of Energy National Laboratories. Most of the laboratories have grown out of the Manhattan Project. right? So we, that was a project that, of course, during World War II to create the, the first nuclear weapons. But coming out of that was this incredible research capability that then grew into the broader energy research capability that the national labs are today. There is a huge wealth of knowledge and expertise at the U.S. National Labs. They did really crazy, innovative things in the 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, and all that experience is still there. I was working on the IFR program, the Integral Fast Reactor, from 1970 to 2004. There were some 87 tests that were run over a course of uh, two years. Both Chernobyl and Three Mile Island would not have happened with this kind of reactor. In the end, we showed that the most severe accidents that can happen could be done safely and without damage to the reactor's systems. And that was the final demonstration that we did in um, about 30 years ago. One of the great ironies of recent years is that one of the most promising uh, nuclear options, the integral fast reactor, was in development, was showing very strong performance criteria, and then it was stopped. It was stopped in 1994. And you go back and ask, why was it stopped? Nobody knows. Well, nuclear, ah, Three Mile Island, we should stop. Uh, not so good. And many, many engineers look back uh, and say, why did we stop? This is one of the most promising ways forward for nuclear technology. The decision was political. And I remember I met with each of the operating crews personally. To a person, the response was, doesn't the country know what it's losing here? But we don't despair at the shutdown because the technology is there. And I think you'll see that people will be discovering that, uh, especially young entrepreneurs, and bringing it to the fold. The information is all there and available to the new generations. As a development economist, I work in a lot of places in the world that don't have electricity. That's pure tragedy. That's watching children die. That's watching clinics that can't function. That's watching schools that don't work because there's no power source. And we use the term energy poverty to signify that you don't have modern energy for daily functions. Today, I would say about 1.4 billion people do not have access to electricity and somewhere about two and a half to three billion do not have access to a clean modern cooking fuel. One big issue that 
developing countries have is that they lack capital and doing huge infrastructure projects is very, very difficult. So it's really necessary, especially in rural areas, to figure out creative and innovative ways to, to get power to people. Here, they have lots and lots of sunlight. So solar is great in Senegal. This system is shared among seven farmers. And even though this is a relatively small amount of power, it completely changes everything for them. This is about a 5 kilowatt array and you need about 100,000 of these to equal a 500 megawatt utility sized power plant. But even the smaller systems like this have a very important place to play in the future as far as electrifying rural populations of uh, developing countries. This is like a first step in the, the energy ladder for a lot of people. But now you come to the car. It's a large city, growing city, and with a million people, it will need electricity round the clock, whether the sun is shining or not. So many places in Africa definitely need a low cost, reliable, carbon neutral power plant that provides electricity 24 seven. Nuclear offers us one of the best options we have to do that kind of base load. I have a strong interest in getting the price of energy lower because of looking at the lives of the poorest. You know, there's a lot of things we take for granted that by 2100 should be available to everyone on the planet. So we need affordable energy. That's why, you know, I'm investing in a nuclear fission company. What Bill Gates and his fellow investors are doing here is there's never been anything like it before. This is private citizens trying to design and build uh, a new technology uh, nuclear reactor. TerraPower fits in really well with what Bill Gates is trying to do. You know, it's one of those things that has some risk to it. Uh, it takes a lot of work, but it's the kind of thing that can really help the world's energy problems. The thing with nuclear, and the reason I never anticipated a private startup company, is that the development, especially for advanced reactors, is a big investment. You know, the radiation tests take years to do. So it really takes someone with really long horizons who's really looking to improve the world in a way that uh, may take a very long time. This is the location of our new lab facility. We are moving from the paper reactor to doing small-scale testing, and this is really a big step for our company going into the industrial type scale, commercial type scale testing. This is our new lab space we've built out. This was a big empty room four months ago. So this is something we have custom designed to support our testing here. Um, if you look over here, uh, you see this big pit, which our five ton bridge crane will be coming in here shortly. And what'll be going in above that pit there is an example here of a full size bundle. So we're actually in full scale testing for this. It's not a small base type scale. Thanks, guys. This is an example of one of our fuel bundles. It's a much shorter version of a fuel bundle, but what's neat is, is this is what sits inside of the reactor that generates the heat for our energy. We're still working on this technology. We haven't pulled it all together and built one yet, but I believe it's gonna happen. I mean, we'd love to build it. Trump international relationships a lot. You think of the space program and everything else. The one thing that people trust engineers generally. Uh, they're not too sure about politicians and big corporations, but they tend to trust engineers because they know engineers, all they want to do is solve the technical problems. busy last 10 months, I'd say. California has lived up to its expectations. It's a place where there's single focus on building your company and focusing on that, working hard. I got kind of a unique opportunity to go to the National Lab and do some work with them. 
and it's really awesome because I love nuclear technology. I love nuclear reactors. I love being around reactor facilities. And I particularly love kind of the, the golden age of, of nuclear research and development in the 50s and 60s. We're standing on the shoulders of giants doing what we're doing, right? Dating back to all of the work that's come through over the last couple of decades. It's a neat legacy that went on out here. It's kind of interesting to think about the history of it and the kind of similarity of what we were going to do. It doesn't like stick up. You can't see it from a big distance. It's like you have to come around a curve and then there it is. And it's like just up against the hills. Yeah, you can see the GE logo and the one water tank that's not even affiliated with the nuclear thing. But you're right, it just blends in. I would love for our units to look kind of like that, just like simple and beautiful. I think I've just romanticized that era so much. You know, it's the 60s, like that's when we did everything. Starting small and working up from there. I mean, GE started here with just a five megawatt plant that produced for how long? 10 years? It was like 10 or 12 years. Yeah, it was a long time. <clears throat> the first one was the grid. connected to the grid. I think it's kind of interesting too, if you think about it, if this was a five megawatt solar array, it would probably cover all of this land and be quite yeah, it'd be obtrusive. Like all There'd be no, over this. no grasses or birds. So it's kind of cool. Go big. Go small to go big. Yep. I contacted two scientific colleagues in China to have a workshop on climate, air pollution, and nuclear power. They really pushed to make this connection, and now I think it may pay off. And so I'm very grateful to my Chinese colleagues for doing that. Most people are surprised to learn that China, even though it's the biggest emitter now by far, is responsible for only 10% of the excess CO2 in the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning while the United States is responsible for more than 25% and the European Union for more than 25%. So that's one thing we need to make clear. We're not blaming them for the climate change, but now we're in the same boat and it's leaky. And either we figure out how to plug those holes together or we all go down together. My observation about China is that things are very siloed. This is the only time ever that the China nuclear people have come together with the China climate people, which is kind of astounding. So I think my role and what Jim asked me to do was come and present, bring those two worlds together and say, why is it that nuclear is, is really important here? You know, when you look at these young people, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. <laughs> that they are going to experience things as a result of our actions. They're going to be alive at the end of the century. That's what this is all about. The whole issue of this climate change, what we're concerned about is the future that we're leaving for those young people. Even though China is going really fast on nuclear, they don't necessarily have all of the technological savvy that we have in the West. So the real opportunity here is to marry up the enormous technological know-how and research base that we have in the US with the enormous demand, not just in China, but in other parts of Asia as well. It's almost a perfect complementarity uh, between the two systems. This issue of climate change just completely overrides all these disagreements you hear about between the United States and China. They seem so unimportant in comparison to the future of both countries for generations to come. There's an opportunity for nuclear power to fundamentally change the way the world generates energy.
And perhaps it's times of crisis to drive major technological change. So it was World War II that drove the development of the atomic bomb and the birth of the nuclear industry in the first place. And I think now perhaps it's climate change that is driving this new generation of nuclear power. I don't think we need a miracle. What we really need is global cooperation on technology. We need to solve problems together because this is hard and it's complex and it's not about the lawyers mainly, it's mainly about the engineering. We're building something that is part of efforts that can fundamentally save the world. Nuclear is going to be so important for that. I feel like the really big difference of what our future could look like in 2030, 2060 is nuclear power can really be a game changer. Silicon Valley didn't just happen. I mean, Silicon Valley was basically invented by the federal government to really pioneer the field of computer science. And I think if we want the next generation of nuclear plants, we need to really be committed to creating the same kind of innovative uh, sector in the nuclear sector. It's gonna require us to think really differently about how we license reactors. And I think we can do it, but we have to decide that we actually want those technologies. People need to advocate for clean energy. Get out there and talk to your neighbors. Let's start that dialogue as a nation. If you have children, talk to them about their future. My kids, my kids are worried about climate change. And so how do you solve that by clean energy? It's a situation where the younger generation is gonna make the changes. And unfortunately, my generation has left them a pretty lousy situation. But when it comes to addressing arguably the, the greatest challenge, certainly the greatest environmental challenge in history, it's the young people that are gonna be driving it. There are examples of countries that reduce their carbon emissions at those rates that we need today, globally. Places like France, which did it in the 1970s and 80s. Sweden, 1980s, and they did that with a big scale up of nuclear power. And they didn't even have the advanced technologies that we're working on today. If big countries like China and India and the US kind of pulled a France, it's definitely doable. It's definitely a feasible example of how we can stop climate change.